A mass shooting at a newspaper office in Maryland. What we know tonight about the deadly attack and a silent protest. Demonstrators call on Border Patrol to end its involvement with President Trump's family separation policy. These are people who are trying as best they can, fleeing for their lives, being persecuted, being threatened. Sanctuary for asylum seekers. KPBS talks with some of the immigrants who are being helped by a network of local churches. I recognize that the city had done very little the last 20 years. And it's a problem few of us see, but is only getting worse and could put everything from homes to the coastline at risk. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. A developing story tonight in Maryland where a gunman opened fire inside the office of a local newspaper. Police say the shooter killed five people and gravely wounded several others. Police have a suspect in custody. They haven't released the man's identity or a possible motive. The newspaper targeted is the Capitol Gazette, which covers the city of Annapolis. We did recover um, what we thought may have been an explosive device that has been taken care of. They were on the scene in about 60 seconds, but beyond that, they went immediately into that building without a moment's hesitation and demonstrated incredible courage. We have more coverage on this story at kpbs.org and on PBS NewsHour tonight at 7. First Lady Melania Trump was in Arizona today. She met with Border Patrol and toured a shelter housing kids who've been separated from their parents. The first stop was Tuscan, where the First Lady met with agents and viewed a short-term holding facility for migrant children. She then traveled to Phoenix to visit a shelter that's working with the Department of Health and Human Services. Public outcry over the separation of families at the border is turning into action. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero shows us how a church in Normal Heights has launched a network of help for asylum seekers. The children of asylum seekers play with donated toys outside the Christ United Methodist Ministry Center. The center has provided shelter to people fleeing violence since the 2016 surge in Haitian migrants. Now, a public outcry over the Trump administration's immigrant family separations has led others to want to help too, says pastor and director Bill Jenkins. This is evil. This is evil to take a baby from a mother's arms. And so it's, it's something that people uh, are seeing and saying, this is not who we are as Americans. So Jenkins is creating what he calls the Safe Harbors Network, a growing outreach program in San Diego County. Already, about a dozen churches and homes have offered to provide temporary beds to asylum seekers. He says those who don't have beds can help with donations, including diapers, toys, and hygiene items. There's a perception out there that Asylum seekers are illegal aliens, as they call them. I hate that term, illegal aliens. But these are people who are trying as best they can, fleeing for their lives, being persecuted, being threatened. Some of them agreed to speak to KPBS on condition of anonymity because they fear retaliation. When I entered here, I had nothing. I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have anything. I thank God because we have a place to stay here. We're not in the street. Even the president cannot separate me and my, my daughter here. 25-year-old Isachi Mansarai agreed to give her name, but didn't want her face shown because she's scared people in her home country might see her. She says she fled Sierra Leone after refusing an arranged marriage. The guy was 80, 87 years old. And uh, I see me, I'm, I'm too young for <laughs> to getting married to an old person because of money. I said no. After refusing the marriage, Isatu says her father started beating her. Even I have a mark from this. And threatening to kill her for not accepting the proposal. So she fled to the U.S. and asked for asylum at the San Ysidro port of entry. Immigration officials released her on parole and dropped her off at the center, where a church volunteer promised help. He said, I will do everything possible for you because I know that you are a 
strong woman. The church isn't yet helping any parents who've been separated from their children. But since the San Diego federal judge ordered the prompt reunification of separated families, the center is expecting to receive some of those families soon, as they're released from detention centers. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. In Chula Vista today, a silent protest of the Border Patrol and its partners. A group of activists held signs outside the local Border Patrol headquarters. Organizers say President Trump's policy of separating families is similar to Japanese internment and the relocation of Native Americans. They say there are more than a dozen local facilities that play a role in the policy. We want San Diegans to know that this is not stopping at the border, that there are facilities throughout the county that are supporting a concentration camp industry in San Diego. The Border Patrol issued a statement to KPBS. It says it's aware of today's demonstration and supports the right to protest, so long as it doesn't intentionally interfere with operations. A federal judge in San Diego has ordered the government to reunite families within 30 days. AP reporter John Moan is in Texas, where the process is a difficult one for parents trying to find their kids. Even a warm West Texas night is a cold comfort for migrants like Wilson Romero. Mi hija es un poquito más clara que mí, chaparrita y bien simpática. Describing his five-year-old girl, the 26-year-old Honduran remains without her. We turned ourselves in to ask for asylum. We jumped in the river under the bridge and later turned ourselves into immigration. She was taken from him after the pair illegally crossed over the U.S. border from Mexico near El Paso, Texas, nearly a month ago. An official came and told us, you are going to jail and we're going to separate your kids. Believe me, it was a very difficult moment. All he has of her at the moment is her name tattooed on his arm. It was very difficult for me to leave her there. My daughter started crying. She grabbed onto my leg and said, Poppy, don't leave me here. I don't want to be here alone. Take me with you. His story is similar to the more than 30 parents staying temporarily in the Casa Vida shelter in El Paso. They fled violence in their home countries for a safer and better life in the U.S. I didn't have time to talk with my son. I had just gotten there and they told me they were going to take him away. I didn't think that was possible. They took him away and he was gone and I didn't have time to tell him anything. The government released the group on June 24th and now the parents are frantically looking for their children. Immigration authorities separated the kids from them so that the parents could be charged with unlawful entry into the United States. Authorities placed their children into government-run youth detention sites. A federal judge has ordered the Trump administration to reunite more than 2,000 children with their parents in 30 days, sooner if the child is younger than five. I didn't know anything about him until yesterday. I talked to him. The social worker put him on with me. The truth is he wouldn't talk. He was mute. I was talking and he only started talking after an hour. I felt very sad. The families took a perilous journey just to get into the United States, only to be separated. Nearly released from federal detention centers, the parents we spoke with could now face a complex legal journey here to reunify with their children even if they already know where they are. But to access them, to make actual contact, is a nightmare. You know, we've been experimenting with, with the numbers and nobody can get through. So several clients I've had that know where the kids are, they can't get through the, through the numbers. El Paso-based Border Network for Human Rights is coordinating legal aid for separated migrant families. The organization believes the federal government has the resources to find the children but not the political will. Some say that it's going to take like a month or a month and a half. I think it's going to take more time than that to reunify thousands of children and thousands of parents. All of the parents at the shelter don GPS ankle monitors, constant location surveillance uploaded to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, a condition of their release. 
It's on them to make phone calls to find their kids. The social worker told me they couldn't send my daughter here. I had to go to my final destination and there they were going to send me some paperwork for me to sign and have stamped and then it would be a week of processing before I could get my daughter back. On Wednesday, Wilson left the shelter and boarded a bus for his mother's house in California, where he hopes the federal government will send his daughter. But that could take a week, a month, or longer. John Moan Associated Press, El Paso, Texas. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, the most consequential Supreme Court decisions of this term and what to expect in the looming battle for a new justice. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. New polling in the race for governor and Senate show two candidates have substantial leads. Democrat Gavin Newsom leads Republican John Cox by nearly 30 points, 58 to 29 percent. 13 percent say they're still undecided. Senator Dianne Feinstein leads state senator Kevin DeLeon 46 to 24 percent. The poll was conducted by the San Diego Union Tribune and 10 News. Likely voters were also asked about the effort to repeal the recent gas tax hike. The poll shows strong support for repeal, 46 to 33 percent. Conservatives such as John Cox and former San Diego City Council member Carl De Mayo are leading in the effort. It would also repeal an increase of DMV vehicle fees. SDG&E wants to raise rates nearly 30 percent over a four-year period. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman went to a public forum today in Chula Vista and talked to customers about the proposal. At Chula Vista City Hall, the California Public Utilities Commission heard how the increase could affect ratepayers. I, I am against, of course, the increase because I am on a fixed income. Mary Sanchez says she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer last year and can't afford any bill increases. What I get from the disability is $600 a month. It's not even enough to pay my $650 rent that I have to pay on top of the utilities and then to have to be able to afford the cost of my groceries and then my gas to get back and forth to my doctors. sdg and &E is asking the Public Utilities Commission to raise rates by 28 percent over four years. To put that in perspective, the last rate increase was 10 percent over three years. When you look at what the grid was 20 years ago, um, it's changed a lot. We have electric vehicles now, we have private solar top systems and all of these things are, are changing grid and we need to make sure we can respond to the demands of, of our customers. If the rate hikes are approved, a typical sdg e customer's bill would go up nearly $14 a month. But for businesses, it could be a lot more. We're over half a million dollars a year in, in electric power. Todd Roberts is president of Marine Group Boatworks. They employ around 200 people repairing large ships. When they do come to San Diego and we tell them their cost of power is going to be, in some cases, 50 percent more than it was in the last port they were in, that's pretty tough for us to attract business. The CPUC is expected to make a final decision on the rate hikes before the end of this year. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Below San Diego's streets lie not just a series of pipes and tunnels, but an expensive problem for the city. The stormwater infrastructure is old and starting to fail. And as Andrew Bowen reports, there's no easy fix. So we're, we're actually at Tourmaline Beach, which is a world-class surf break here in San Diego and actually throughout California. Um, and we're walking up a stormwater conveyance channel. Matt O'Malley is chief executive of San Diego Coast Keeper, a nonprofit that advocates for clean water. This storm drain we're walking up looks kind of like a half pipe with vegetation creeping down from the sides. It empties right out onto the beach. That sort of starts upstream, collects a lot of the runoff throughout the region and in both Tourmaline area and PB and upstream and sort of channels all that down into the, oh, there's a dead rat, down into the, um, <laughs> down into the water here. The storm drain here is not very clean. We step over garbage, algae, a trickle of water O'Malley calls urban drool. And at the very end, we reach a big concrete pipe. Goes pretty far. It's wild. <laughs> a recent report from the city auditor's office found big shortcomings in the way the city funds and maintains this kind of infrastructure. Failing pipes have led to flooding, sinkholes, property damage, and lawsuits. The report says at the current pace, it would take the city 95 years to replace all of its failing stormwater pipes. 
O'Malley feels vindicated by the report. And it recognized that the city had done very little the last 20 years, both to educate the public about the lack of funding for stormwater infrastructure and to actually do something about it. I mean, it's been recognized that there are pretty strict uh, Stormwater and Clean Water Act requirements. The city has failed to live up to those obligations, but not only that, they failed to try and do anything about making up the significant funding gaps in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Our mission is really twofold. First is to reduce the risk of flooding for our residents off our streets and, and properties. And then second is to protect and improve water quality in our local waterways and at our beaches. Drew Kleiss is the deputy director of the city's stormwater division. He says the audit acknowledges a lot of the efficiencies and cost savings the city has undertaken to more quickly repair its failing stormwater infrastructure. Overall, we're very pleased with the audit and its findings, largely because the findings are just a continuation of a lot of strategies and program improvements that we've already put in place. That's partly true, but the audit also found that city leaders have known for decades about the lack of funding for stormwater infrastructure and have taken no action to address it. The city is short more than $450 million just over the next five years. Ultimately, it may have to ask voters for a tax or fee increase. But under the city's proposed timeline, its long-term funding strategy won't be ready in time for the next elections in 2020. Kleiss explains why. Well, I think the most important point is that the picture on what our funding needs will be is likely to evolve and it will change and hopefully downward in a downward direction. The city is currently negotiating with water quality regulators, hoping for more time to comply with the law. That could make its obligations a little cheaper. O'Malley says the city has waited long enough, but he doesn't blame city staff for the stormwater division's shortcomings. He says ultimately, elected officials are the ones who are failing to lead. If stormwater is a hidden infrastructure project, it's not very sexy, right? You have housing, you have transit. Those are, those are things that are forefront and center. Um, but no one has really stepped up to be the champion for stormwater and for clean water in our region to recognize that there is this gap and step up for it. So what we're working to do is identify that leader and really work with that person to come up with measures to fund stormwater. One thing city staff have agreed to implement a public outreach campaign educating residents about the need for more money for stormwater. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. The plan to build 2,000 new homes in North County is moving forward. KPBS reporter Allison St. John is following the arguments for and against the project. The development would require a lot of blasting and granite hilltops overlooking valleys currently filled with flower and succulent nurseries and a few scattered homes. The developer, Newland Communities, says the new master plan community would provide homes for every generation, from young families to retirees. People in support of the project spoke at the hearing of losing children to other states because they cannot find houses they can afford to buy in San Diego. And Ernie Cohen of the North San Diego County Association of Realtors said businesses are having trouble trouble hiring because employees cannot afford to buy homes here. Our realtors have been beginning to hear from employers who are beginning to feel pressure uh, because they're, they're unable to hire em, uh, employees because they can't uh, find a place to live in San Diego County. Uh, institutions like uh, Cal State San Marcos, uh, Palomar Hospital are suffering because some of their staff has moved up to uh, Orange uh, Riverside County, I'm sorry, uh, because there's jobs there where they live. But others talked about the traffic impacts of more than doubling the population of this rural community where local roads are already gridlocked. Recent fires in the region have raised the specter of people not being able to evacuate in time. Kathy Van Ness is chief operating officer of the Golden Door Spa, which operated there for the last 60 years. You haven't heard Golden Door say and say, oh, no development, no this. We have never said that. But what we have said is, I was there when we couldn't evacuate, and we had to evacuate, but the streets were shut down. I, we're, th we're there investing in the farmlands. We understand the water problem. We see it. So when we sit here and listen to all this, we live there. It's about our community. And do we want to have some of these communities left? And, and Golden Door's going to fight. The full Board of Supervisors is due to vote on this project in late September, but the Golden Door is considering the option of putting it on the ballot if they do approve it. Allison St. John, KPBS News. Go to any beach in San Diego and you'll find all kinds of plastic littered on the beach. KPBS environmental reporter Eric Anderson has new details on this growing problem here and around the world. 
Clean water advocates say the planet may be seeing a new coastal pollution trend. 2017 was the first year that the top 10 items picked up during an international cleanup day were made from plastic. Now, the Ocean Conservancy's Nicholas Mallow says the top items used to be rope, paper, and beverage cans. But now he says cigarette butts, food wrappers, and beverage bottles top the list. Based on science that continues to be published in the peer-reviewed literature, we do know that there is more plastic entering the ocean each year. And so it is absolutely a fact. Mallow suggests people use reusable bags and bottles and that they decide not to ask for a plastic straw when dining out. California has banned single-use plastic bags, and there is some momentum in the city of San Diego to ban styrofoam. The next International Cleanup Day is in September. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. It was pretty cool here today, especially at that coastline as the clouds took their time getting out of the area. As we head into tomorrow, things turn seasonal all across San Diego County. And we have some details on your early week forecast as 4th of July is coming up. Our last six hours, satellite and radar pretty quiet here in uh, California, even down towards San Diego. Not too much to worry about. We will see the clouds return for tonight due to that marine layer and will cool down to 64 here in San Diego. A low of of 52 in Ramona, 71 in Barugu Springs, and a low of 54 in Mount Laguna. We head into your Friday seasonal temperatures for the southwest. Our regular spot's going to be very warm and dry as always. So if you are in the desert areas, you know the drill. Keep yourself hydrated. Wear those light colors. Temperatures will be in the triple digits for Borrego Springs, uh, 72 at Oceanside. Once again, we're getting some morning and nighttime clouds, but overall a, a lovely day. Feeling comfortable near that coastline. So the extended forecast here, not too much to be sad about. We're going to be feeling amazing uh, clouds and sun throughout the day uh, and temperatures in the lower 70s at the coast. We head into the inland in the upper 70s, then trending into the lower 80s for your Monday and Tuesday, the days leading up to uh, your 4th of July. Maybe you're taking off the rest of this week all the way into next week. And if you are, well, things right now are looking dry inland and the even better at that uh, in the mountains as well. Abundance amount of sunshine, no cloud cover anticipated. Temperatures will be in the lower 70s and trending their way into the upper 70s, a tad bit warmer for your Monday and Tuesday. And our lows will be cooling down into the upper 50s. Nothing uh, not typical for this time of year. The deserts, once again, we just need to stay hydrated. Plenty of sunshine. No features at this time that's going to bring us uh, any wet weather. We could see winds increase as we head into uh, your early week forecast. Temperatures will be trending near normal here. Uh, Monday, a high of 105 and the lows in the 70s. For KPBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Dodgy Swat. Back to you, Ebony. San Diego International Airport is showing off a new look for Terminal 2. These pictures show the redesigned internal arrivals area. One of the biggest upgrades is new biometrics technology. The airport says it will help reduce wait times at customs. In the age of smartphones, parents face a growing challenge in monitoring what their kids see online. AP reporter Carrie Antelfinger reports on how tech-savvy kids are often living secret digital lives. When Ariel Miller's mom blocked Twitter on her phone, the 13-year-old found another way and got a message from a stranger. This guy asked to see my feet, and I was like, what? Despite monitoring apps and restrictions placed on phones, parents like Ariel's mom are finding the technology designed to keep their kids safe online isn't foolproof. So it's like you can't be everywhere all the time. Especially when the devices most kids carry make it that much easier to have secret lives on social media and other apps. As time went on, the technology got faster, the technology got smaller, the technology went to younger kids. Rich Wastocki is a retired I'll Naperville police detective who specializes in cyber crimes. He now speaks around the country to law enforcement, parents, and students on the sneaky ways kids are using their phones right under their parents' noses. When you give your child this ominous device, it's like giving them the keys to your brand new Cadillac. As the number of apps and games continually morph, Wistaki says it makes it harder for parents to keep up. Even young kids can chat with strangers on apps like WhatsApp, House Party, and Musical.ly. 
Some apps are purposely disguised, like this calculator that's actually a secret photo vault. Kids also find ways around their parents' rules by logging into friends' accounts. Wastaki says some parents are too trusting and give kids too much freedom. They suffer from something called NMK syndrome. Not my kid. My kid would never do that. Nathan Hale Elementary School principal Dawn Isles Gomez agrees. The school requires kids to leave their phones in homeroom throughout the day. I cannot even imagine how much is going on that we have no clue. And I'm saying that as someone who works with kids and is decent with technology. One parent had no idea her daughter was messaging with a strange boy on Snapchat until her older daughter alerted her. And I think as parents, we need to wake up, no doubt. What about Jasmine? It's a full-time job. Like not only parent, not only parenting, you know, raising kids, that, that, that's a full-time job, especially with social media. Jania Bivens and other parents have learned they can't take anything for granted. Carrie Antelfinger, Associated Press. Now here's a look at what we are working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, busing tables and taking care of other people's kids. Planet Money takes a look at teen summer jobs and why it may be a fading tradition. And on Midday Edition, a preview of the big issues and top candidates in Mexico's presidential election this weekend. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.